night, you're advertised in the newspaper and advertising flyers. We could find no advertising personnel that ever heard of them. The Screen Actors Guild had no listing for them. Actress Pat Douglas had called them about a job as a teacher for their advertised acting workshops. She was turned down. She was suspicious because Lightyear personnel would not give her the name of their directors, nor would they allow her to visit their studios. Everything had to go through the mail and everything cost money, even applying for a job with Lightyear. Pat was told by their secretary that their studio was at 2725 Northwest Expressway. That turned out to be a private mailbox in a printing office. I had in your corner associate producer Meredith Sanders apply for the screen test. It cost $20 for registration. The name on the cancel check was L.M. Lemmerman. Local people in television advertising did not know that name, nor did the Oklahoma Film Board. They also did not recognize the name of Jay Lemmerman, whose address is 3100 Northwest 47th. Lightyear's telephones ring at that address. There does not appear to be a television studio there. Meredith received an invitation to a talent interview and screen test session at the Crosswinds Inn Motel Northwest. We went along, and while she was being interviewed, I went in to ask about Lightyear's operation. We talked with Mr. Lemmerman, who identified himself as the president of Lightyear. I tried to find out what their plans were, what credentials they had to teach acting. Lemmerman said he was going to teach the acting workshop, but his credentials mainly showed experience in the technical end of television production and very little directing. But you're already advertising that you have acting classes in, in the newspaper. Actors workshop. Yeah. I mean, how can, you, how can you advertise such a thing when you don't have a facility, you don't have any instructors, and you don't have any qualifications to do it yourself, other than the fact that you did some industrial films and uh, were a videotape operator? Well, the TV field uh, is a very broad one. Uh, and when, when you say acting or actor's workshop, you're talking of taking a person off the street and training them follow the director's directions before the camera mm -hmm. uh, and take them through the production stages uh, and that's what we're doing. It's a, it's a basic workshop. Uh, here's my resume if you'd like to see uh, that. Techni technical director of the Baptist Medical Center Television Studio, switcher director, uh, broadcast engineer, troubleshooting, maintenance, service systems, computer systems repair, honorable discharge, uh, education, high school, first class communication school. This is all technical. Yes, that's It's technical. all technical. This is all what, what an engineer does. Well, I'm Why aren't you advertising engineering classes instead of acting classes? Because there are, uh, it's, this is our You don't first have any credentials here for teaching acting. Well, you, you have great credentials for being an engineer. That's correct. But you don't have any You've credentials. You have to start to somewhere. <laughs> you do. You, you don't. You have to start somewhere, but you don't advertise you're going to teach acting classes when your credentials are in engineering. Because these people probably think that, that you can teach them how to act, but you don't have the credentials to do it. We will teach the people basic uh, studio terminology. You can go through and uh, take the time to look at our, our schedule, what we'll be training. Well, I'm, I'm, I've seen your schedule. I've seen your advertisements and so forth. What I want to see are the credentials to do that and the people to do that, the people with the experience to do that. I wouldn't have the nerve to say, I've been in news for uh, 20 years. I'm going to teach you how to act or teach you how to repair a videotape machine. But that's what you got here. Well, Lemmerman's associate, Miss Warner, could not show me any credentials either. She said she had written screenplays, but would not name them or tell me where they had aired. This, this is a new business. What did you do before? Writing and screenplay writing. But you haven't shown me anything that you've done. Plus, I'm a licensed cosmetologist, so I broke into motion pictures doing makeup years and years years ago over in the Panama Canal Zone with working for the Southern Command Network. So what we've got there. here is a broadcast engineer and a cosmetologist who are advertising acting classes, screen tests, no. HBO, TV This is TV what you commercial. are saying. You are refusing to read his resume. I read his resume and there's nothing you, on okay, there that you qualifies cannot, him to be a director. But you cannot. He is a director. <laughs> he has worked as a director already. He, he is a director. For, but for commercials and movies, Television. That's what we're going into. Those are my projects. What's wrong with that? 
Lightyear is charging from $60 to $100 for acting workshops, but could not show me the credentials to teach acting, nor the names of other personnel who could. Miss Warner said they were looking for instructors. Lemmerman said he would teach the classes, but later admitted he had only made one commercial in his past. Lemmerman said they have studio equipment, but no studio. Miss Warner said they would have a studio in five days that we could visit. Right now, they were collecting talent, inexperienced talent, Oklahomans only. They will appear in one commercial, a commercial for an unnamed product, not made at Lightyear Studios, but at a local UHF TV station. And they will not be paid for it, but can buy a copy for their resumes. Our associate producer, Meredith Sanders, who interviewed with Lightyear, told us later she sat for an on-camera test for Lemmerman. I just sat there and he was looking at the monitors, there are two monitors, and I just sat there and he was done about three minutes later. Did you see your picture on the monitors? Mm -hmm. Do you know if they actually recorded anything? I think the cameras were just on all the time and the person, whoever just sat down there was on the monitor. I don't think they were recording. I see. And when we were done, I asked him, I said, was, was anything taped? He said, no, but I recorded it in this book and he had just marked down something after looking at me. I see, but you couldn't see what was in the book? No. no. So you have no idea whether they really did uh, take any pictures of you for use in the... I don't believe they did. In I met with a group of five ladies who all have relatives or friends in Care Manor Nursing Home in Tuttle. The ladies told me they were worried about the heat. Sarah Defabaugh said the air conditioning at Care Manor was out for several weeks. Well, are your relatives suffering out there? Well, yes, Just I think so. Air. From the air, yes. Mother has to have air. And that's why we have to furnish fans for her, because she can't breathe without the air, sir. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, what about ice now? Is Mother has to have ice, too, and that's why we see that she has ice if we have to go buy it out of our own pocket and take it to her. Nellie Kettler has a sister in Care Manor. She just returned from the hospital. Because she would just lay there and just be wet with sweat when I'd go down at 4 o'clock. And we just, she been in the hospital over a week now with kidney infection. I see. We just brought her back today. I know she's roasting in the mm -hmm. oh, restaurant. Oh yes, we just had to take that fan down for her. It helps some, but it's not very much. The lady said there was some air conditioning in the nursing home, but not throughout the home. Plus, they said the ice machine was broken. In addition, some felt Care Manor was understaffed, that there were not enough attendants. They also commented that some of the food was bad and occasionally cold. They said for $800 a month, it should be better. And Nellie said the rates went up recently. I think uh, those people got a Social Security raise not too long ago. Yes, they did this in July. Mm -hmm. And what happened out at the rest home? Well, well, we got a notice from the well. She had been paying $94 a month out of her little Social Security check. Mm -hmm. And we got a notice that she would have to pay $104 now out of it. I see. So you think right after they got a raise in their Social Security, the rates went up at the yes. nursing home to get that extra money? Yes, they did. It's we went to visit Care Manor and found on our arrival that the air conditioner repairmen were there working on the repairs. The workmen said they would be finished that night. Owner Gary All was also there and explained the difficulties. Uh, the ice machine's been fixed, uh, and uh, when we get the air conditioner going now, we should be 100% okay. Out of five units, we only had one unit that was down, but. Uh, Air during the summer, everybody is, uh, the air conditioning people are busy. <laughs> can't get them out. I can't get them out just at my beck and call. Yeah. However, uh, as I told the health department, uh, when the complaint was registered with them, they called and uh, sent a, an inspector out and uh, wanted to know uh, what we were doing about it. And I told them that the compressor has been ordered. 
Oh, and the guy was going to put it in just as soon as we got the compressor. And uh, so we were doing yeah. everything that I thought was humanly possible. Do you provide fans when the air goes out for them? There are fans in uh, that we were circulating through the hallway. Oh. Uh, plus, I kept the fans on in the air conditioners, even yeah. though the unit was down, the fan was not down, so we were still circulating as much cold air from the rest of the building uh, that we could. Well, they, they're also a little upset about the food. Plus, I kept the fans on in the air conditioners, even though the unit was down, the fan was not down, so we were still circulating as much cold air from the rest of the building uh, that we could. Well, they, they're also a little upset about the food. They say that some of it's uh, served cold and uh, isn't too good. You have a registered mm. dietitian on We stand. do have a registered dietitian consultant that uh, comes once a month. City softball player Wilburn Henry called in your corner about the restrooms at Portland Park where there were no lights. He and several others also commented that the restrooms in Tolan Park on Reno were more like a disaster area than a public facility, and it was the worst I saw. It's just pathetic because it, you know, there was a, uh, some snakes over at Tolan Park on Reno Street. It's, that's not too, uh, too great. This is supposed to be a family sport. All the families come out, and all the kids and so forth. The players had started a petition around which they were going to give to the city, asking for a cleanup. However, In Your Corner learned the City League has a softball association and it is responsible for the routine maintenance of the restrooms. The city is only responsible for repairs. That, according to Parks and Recreation Director Ken Wilson. So we recommended that the players work out an arrangement with the Softball Association for maintenance. But when Ken Wilson saw the condition of Tolan Park restrooms, he said there would be a cleanup today. And on our arrival, I found the restrooms clean and odor-free today, and city employees busy trying to repair the restroom facilities, which had been vandalized. The workers said that's been a problem in park restrooms that are left open. At least one park restroom, they said, had been repaired three times because of vandals. In your corner, hopes that everyone will help to prevent this from happening again. On another... Oh, well. <laughs> On another case tonight, there is more help now for Lynn Farley. Wednesday, we reported that Lynn had called for some help. He had just had shoulder surgery and had to wear a body cast through the three hottest summer months. He was unable to continue work as a truck driver or cab driver during the healing process, so he was unemployed. Still, Lynn had been riding the bus every day looking for a job. But the heat was unbearable inside that cast, especially inside his one-room apartment. He needed an air conditioner. Well, Tom Chabineau, owner of the Sight and Sound stores, donated one, which brought great relief to Lynn. However, his food supply had run out. He had only $12 worth of food stamps. But in your corner viewers took care of that problem. Herb Black Cat Campbell called from the farmer's market. He said the businessman there wanted to help. He gave us donations of fresh produce from Zach's, Stout's, and Woody's produce. Everything from fresh corn to tomatoes, okra, onions, plums, peaches, cantaloupes, and a watermelon. We first got my wife to thank for this. She's the one that watched it on your channel and then called you to see what the boy needed. Yeah. And we got the man I work for is uh, Kenneth Stout. Also, Zach's Produce and Woody's Produce. Lynn was surprised to see us again with another show of kindness, but that wasn't all. An anonymous donor asked us to give Lynn his $100 donation. The gentleman had been recovering from a broken back and said he knows only too well what Lynn is going through while wearing that cast and trying to get by on his own. And another donation of $10 came in from Eva John of Oklahoma City, who just wanted to help out somebody today. We presented it all to a stunned Lynn Farley. I'll give a little bit we can help out and that's
It's easy to find the Walters home in Bethany. Just follow the white and blue birds across the treetops and see where they land. For the past few months, they've been landing in the trees in the backyard of the Walters family. And if you look under the trees, guess what's been landing there? You guessed it, layers and layers of droppings and feathers. Despite weekly cleanups, the yard has taken on an odor of ammonia. Flies and fleas hover over those droppings. Feathers cover the ground and fill the air. Dead birds hang in the branches and often are found on the patio crawling with maggots. And the Walters say the sanitation men won't haul away the cans with dead birds inside, so they have to burn them. In our first report, we found the birds are protected by the government, so they can't be disposed of. We also found that the birds do much good for the wheat crop in Oklahoma by eating grasshoppers from the fields. So the Walters have a real problem there. Now that the birds have nested in the trees and had their young, they won't leave until the young are ready to fly away. This is one of the young of the egrets. It's protected by the federal government. These are the young of the Walters family, four-year-old Angie and Marisa. Who's protecting them? Well, their parents are trying to, keeping them out of the mess in the backyard. You guys used to play out here, didn't you? Do you, you play out here anymore? How come? Because it's dirty. Well, so far, no one has been able to help the Walters family. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service can't because the birds are federally protected. In fact, they've already chased the birds from one location earlier this year, and that's how the birds ended up at the Walters house. City zoo officials would like to see the birds nest in the zoo area and have moved a few of the birds there, but that's all they can do. Next, I checked with a member of the Audubon Society, naturalist Warren Harden, who says making the habitat unattractive to the birds this winter while they are gone might prevent them from coming back. The birds are there because it's the right habitat. It's a good place to nest. There's food nearby, there's shelter, and uh, they like to be with one another. They're quite gregarious. Uh, population builds up this summer. Doesn't look very good for next spring, I'm afraid. And I really feel for the people in defense of the birds. They do eat a lot of insects. Uh, but in defense of the people, they have a real problem in the backyard, <laughs> on the roof and everywhere else. So I, there is no real solution at the present time. I wish that somebody would work on the solution so that people and nature can live together instead of annihilating one another at times. And annihilation must certainly be on the mind of Zach Walters at this point. He's figured about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars damage to his property, paying people to clean up the yard, damage to the trees, to the landscaping, to yard furniture, and future costs to have the entire area disinfected when the birds leave, having the nests removed from the trees. Well, Zach says he's been a patient man, but it gets frustrating being referred from one government office to another with no help. He's thinking of trying his own means. Well, yeah, because I, I believe now I've gone along with the wildlife commission as far as I can because they told me they'd be gone by the end of July. And we are getting this place in shape to sell, and I, I'm going to have to do something about it. If they don't want to do something about it, I'll just have to take it on my own, which we have to an extent to try to keep them away from the house. And they, even that's they seem to fail now because they are encroaching right on the, in the backyard, as you can see, and up on the house. So we'll have to do something about it. Do you have any idea what? Well, I... I don't, believe, I don't believe I could comment on that because I don't want to, I don't want to have that held over my head. If, but I'll, I will get rid of the birds. Okay. Renting a junker is cheaper than renting a new car from one of the major car rental agencies. But even at that, are they worth it? I had in your corner associate producer Meredith Sanders go in to find out. Of the three agencies we tested, Rent-A-Rec was the cheapest. Rent-A-Rec is located at a Ford dealership on North May near the 39th Expressway. They charge $10.95 a day and give you 50 free miles. Not a bad deal price-wise. Of the three we tested, Rent-A-Rec was the quickest at renting a car. It took only about 10 minutes. Meredith did not select their best car nor the worst. She drove out in a 1972 Chevrolet Impala. We met her at a nearby park to look it over. Now the cars are not meant to be plush or beautiful, and this one was not. But it was fairly clean. The air conditioner worked, as did the radio, so it was comfortable. Now, what about safety? Well, the car was inspected. The speedometer and odometer worked. The emergency flashers worked, as did the turning signals and the headlights and the brake lights. 
Under the hood, I found a dirty motor, but there were several new parts and a battery only a few months old, indicating that Renarec serviced the automobiles. Looking at the tires, we found little tread on the front tires, but the rear tires had little wear on them and appeared to be in good road condition. We took a short road test in the car. The motor ran rough, but did not stall out even with the air conditioner running. The front wheels were slightly out of alignment, but we had no trouble steering the car. One safety item, the seat belts were somehow folded into their holders and were unusable. But overall, the car was in running condition and appeared to be a good deal for $10.95 a day and 50 free miles. At a little bit higher price, but a little bit better car, we found a Drive-A-Dog on Northwest 39th Expressway in the 4000 block. Here, our associate producer, Meredith, rented a station wagon, but it was also an early 1970s Chevrolet. Drive-A-Dog charged $12.95 a day, $2 more than rent -a -Rec. It also allows 50 free miles, as does rent -a -Rec. drive Drive-A-Dog's cars are also for sale which might account for why it was in much better physical shape and ran much better than our last test car. Their motto is rent and try, like and buy. We did like it. The car was clean, the upholstery good, air conditioner and radio worked, even a power window in the rear of the wagon worked. We found that the motor started without hesitation and idled smoothly. The emergency flashers, the turning signals, brake lights and headlights all worked. I found a relatively new battery under the hood and the motor appeared to be in well-serviced condition. Once again, this car had shallow tread on the front tires. The rear tires had a little more tread, however, and were steel-belted radials. Drive-A-Dog puts a 100-mile radius driving limit on their cars. These tires looked as though they would handle that easily and safely. We took it out for a test ride and found no problems. The motor and the car ran smoothly. The speedometer and odometer also worked. Meredith also commented that she got the best service at Drive-A-Dog. The dealer was pleasant and took the time to go over the car with her, explaining how everything worked. Although Drive-A-Dog was $2 more a day than rent a wreck, the car was well worth it. I met operators Larry Lemmerman and his wife Jill, who goes by the name Miss Warner. They said they were taking local people and training them for commercials and screen work. I asked Larry Lemmerman who his directors were. He said he was the director. I asked who would be teaching the actors workshops. Miss Warner said they were looking for instructors. Larry said he was the instructor. I asked what his credentials were for teaching such a workshop. Here's my resume, if you'd like to see that. Technical director of the Baptist Medical Center Television Studio, switcher director, uh, broadcast engineer, troubleshooting, maintenance, service systems, computer systems repair, honorable discharge, uh, education, high school, first class communication school. This is all technical. Yes, that's it's technical. It's all technical. This is all what, what an engineer does. Well, I'm Why aren't you advertising engineering classes instead of acting classes? Because there are... Uh, it's, this is our You don't first have any credentials here for teaching acting. We will teach the people basic uh, studio terminology. Lemmerman later revealed that he had only made one commercial before while working at a hospital educational television unit. They're charging now from $60 to $100 to attend the actor's workshops, and they will award each one a certificate of on-camera acting excellence, even though they could not produce such credentials for themselves. They also charge $5 to be listed in their show business directory to be distributed nationally to all talent outlets. Miss Warner, who claimed to be a screenwriter, could not produce any credentials in that area or anywhere her plays have been produced. She also admitted that they did not have a studio but would have one in five days and promised we could come and have a look. Lightyear tells us their studios are here in this small shopping center in Bethany. However, Miss Warner has reneged on her offer to show us around the studio. She's accused us now of trying to steal her secret plans that she has for Lightyear. Over the phone, she told me she was working for God, planning free productions for local churches, and accused me of trying to ruin that. 
However, I asked if that was announced in their press release announcing their grand opening. Ms. Warner said no, that was one of her secrets. Ms. Warner, who claimed to be a screenwriter, still refuses at this point to show us any credentials in that field or any field related to television, movies, or television commercials. Well, despite the fact that Lightyear has changed their minds about promising to show us their studios, I did talk to one woman who signed up with Lightyear and attended Lightyear's grand opening. About uh, rows of lights in the ceiling, cameras and cables and... Uh... There was one picture camera on a tripod and that was it. Did they say that they would be making commercials there or productions of any sort? They didn't ask, or they didn't tell me. It turns out Lightyear's equipment came from a local hospital educational TV unit. They told me the gear was obsolete. We could find no local advertising outlet or church organization that heard of or from Lightyear. Can they help people get into show business? Well, they promised those who signed up they'd be in a local commercial. But professional actors and actresses, as well as local advertising agencies and program directors, say you need training from professionals with experience and education. Then you need to be in the show business centers, New York, or Los Angeles to strive for your break. I met Gail Conley at Oklahoma Memorial Hospital to hear more about the Spinal Cord Society. Gail is not a patient at the hospital. She's in training there as an occupational therapist, one year left to go. But how many years she has left in a wheelchair is uncertain. It depends on the success of technology being worked on today, as well as the study of drugs that might affect the spinal cord. Not so enough research and a lot of it attitudes, people just not knowing about it. Are some of these drugs you're talking about illegal or not yet approved by the... Uh... Not for what they're wanting to use them for. DMSO, you know, is very controversial. Six years ago, Gail suffered spinal cord injury in a car wreck. The injury paralyzed her legs, but she refuses to believe it is permanent. That's why she talks about the Spinal Cord Society's motto, Cure, Not Care. What we would rather them spend just half or a fourth as much money on the cure, which would keep people up walking so they wouldn't need all the ramps and the big bathrooms and the things like this, instead of spending so much money on breaking down curbs that they've already built that, you know, should have been built right the first time, or building buildings like this that have steps and they have to put in elevators, or ramps, or, you know, lifts. But if they was to spend a fourth of the money that they spend on the accessibility part of it, and they're having to do this because there are getting to be so many people put in wheelchairs. Gale says taking that money and funneling it into the cure could speed along research, such as that of Dr. Gerald Petrovsky at Wright State University in Ohio. Dr. Petrovsky is working on an electrical stimulator that will be, in, when he gets through with it, the finished product will be implanted under the skin so that nothing will be shown. And right now he's got uh, paraplegics and quadriplegics riding bicycles with the baskets on the side that carry the little machine around because it's still quite large, but uh, he, from what I've heard, has promised that he could have it down, condensed down, small enough to implant under the skin within the year. And uh, SES has just granted him like 6,000 or something like that to continue on with his research. And to get something like that here in Oklahoma, we just have to have the researchers or the doctor or someone that has worked with Dr. Petrowski to, you know, just to do it. I don't think anybody in Oklahoma knows about it. The bionic equipment is not the complete answer or cure for spinal cord injuries, but it seems to be getting closer to reality while the drug treatments are still under testing. And the Spinal Cord Society says advances in treatment right after an injury, which might prevent paralysis, are not perfected and applied all across the country. And why is this a problem that we should all be concerned about? Because of the great number of spinal injuries. In Oklahoma alone, I don't know, but in the United States there's one every 30 minutes happening and of those there's yes that will put them in a wheelchair supposedly for life but uh, the research that they're coming up with now is uh, helping get them out of wheelchairs or back up and around 